Good morning. It's very good to see you. I'm so glad that you have taken the time to join us this morning here at North Shore Community Church. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. Glad that you're being part of this series as well. Um, kind of as our introduction to the Northwest continues, uh, our whole family kind of caught some kind of a version of the plague this week. Um, and uh, it's a hazing ritual in the Northwest, I've been told. So that's just part of as we get kind of settled in. But just, I just say that just in case my voice feels a little kind of, it breaks a little bit. Um, I will get through it, we'll get through it, so hang in there with me. Uh, we're in the third week of a four-week series around this character in the Bible named Jonah. And, uh, you know, Jonah is this amazing little book. And I hope as we've been going through this book, you've taken some time to read through it, just to spend time in this text. There's so much meaning packed into each phrase. We could spend days on each chapter. So I figure it'd be fine if we just spend a few hours right now on chapter three. Can we do that? Just a few hours at church and... Um, We're actually gonna be turning to Jonah chapter three, so if you have a Bible, you can turn there. You can use a Bible app on your phone. I think it's in the North Shore app. Um, We're gonna have it on the screens overhead. I'll be teaching from right here. You can also rock it old school and go to the paper version in front of you. But as you you turn, let's just kind of do a little bit of a review. If you've missed one of the last couple of weeks, just to get us all caught up where we are, the story of the book of Jonah begins with God calling Jonah, and it says this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now remember, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and Assyria is the great enemy of Israel. This means that that Nineveh is the last place that a prophet of God, a a holy man, a person who loves God would want to go, would want to be. So you can imagine Jonah's first thought, his first impulse is no way, no how, no thank you. A friend of mine who's kind of a Dr. Seuss fanatic, imagine Jonah answering God this way. He said, no, I will not go there in a boat. I will not go there in a float. I would not go there in a gale. I would not go there in a whale. I do not like the people there. If they died, I would not care. I do not want to go to that great town. I'd rather choke. I'd rather drown. I will not go by land or sea, so stop this talk and let me be. Or something like that. I, uh, I, didn't make, I didn't write that, so you can, you know, but anyway. And so Jonah doesn't go to Nineveh. In fact, he runs the opposite direction. Remember, remember, remember where he goes? He goes the opposite way to Tarshish, just the opposite direction, as far as he can go from Nineveh as possible. Because when the going gets tough, the tough vacation in Europe, right? That's where they want to be. They want to get out, get some sun. To get there, Jonah goes down from Jerusalem to a city called Joppa, and then he goes down to the harbor to a ship. He goes down into the hole, and he goes down to, see, down to sleep. Jonah's life going down, 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 down. But of course, one of the surprises we saw in the first chapter of the book of Jonah is when things are going down, God is often up to something great. God causes a great wind, which produces a great storm, and the sailors felt this great fear, and they begin to throw cargo overboard until Jonah, came, until Jonah came and said, look, you're throwing out the wrong stuff. The reason the storm is here is because of my running from God, or me running from God. The only cargo you need to throw overboard is me. And with no other option in sight, they decided to throw Jonah overboard, and the seas became calm and the text says that those sailors made vows to God. They believed in God. Just throw out your pastor and people will get saved. That's sort of the moral of the story as I can see it. But where is Jonah? Jonah is going down and down and down, down into the sea, down until Jonah hits literally rock bottom. And then the text says, God provides a great fish that swallows up Jonah. And the, you know, the whale's called Monstro, and the boy who's running is Pinocchio, and he's wanting to be a real boy. And wait a minute, that's a different story, actually, right? It, but we get a little fuzzy with this part of the story. We kind of have this cartoonish version of the Jonah story in our minds, but for the ancient reader, the point was not the fish. It was the grace of God who sent it. It was the grace of the God who would deliver this person who had run so far from God. As Wolfgang so aptly put it last week, you can run away from God, but you can't outrun God. And then for three days and three nights, Jonah is praying to God in the belly of the great fish, and the text says that God hears him, that God is listening to him. And there's a really profound lesson, even in this part of the story, that God is never more than a prayer away. 
that God is never more than a prayer away, even if it feels like you feel far from God, even if you feel like you've, you've not prayed in years or you don't believe in prayer, even not sure that there's a God exists, God is never more than a prayer away. And then at the end of last week, God causes the fish to spit Jonah back out onto dry land and Jonah's life is spared and Jonah doesn't get what he's deserved. Jonah is saved. And it's this amazing picture of grace. It's an amazing picture of salvation. Just imagine for a moment what Jonah would be feeling in this moment. Just imagine. I mean, something like, I'm alive. I'm covered in fish vomit, but I'm alive, right? God, you are so good. God, your grace is enough. God, yay God, praise God, all glory to him. God, we need to do something about this. We need to keep this spiritual momentum going. In fact, I should write this down. We should write a book. I'll call it Tuesdays with Jonah and we'll process all the ways that you've done work in my life. And God, we should build a church right here on this beach. A beach is a great place for church. People will come from miles. There's beautiful views and there's great parking and what an amazing place it could be to celebrate the grace grace of God right here. People will come, won't they? And if Nineveh wants to be there, Nineveh can just come down to the beach and worship with us, which is where we pick up the story. Jonah chapter three, verse one. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Question, does it sound like God has moved on? Does it sound like God has changed his mind? Does it sound like God is thinking, you know, forget the whole Nineveh thing. That was difficult. It was hard. Things got kind of messy. We had to get this whole fish thing going on. It got a little crazy. Why don't we just, just scratch that? Let's do something else that's not so challenging. Let's do something a little more palatable for all of us. But to Jonah's dismay, God's plans have not changed, have they? God's call remains the same. I want you to go to the great city of Nineveh. Jonah, I don't know if you get it by now. I don't know where you're planning to run next, but here's what's happening. We're going to Nineveh. You and me, we're going no matter what. Now, I've already pointed out some kind of recurring word themes in this book, that Jonah's life seems to always be on the way down. And that even when things are going down, God seems to be up to something great. Well, there's another word that we begin to see reappearing in the story that's really important for us, and it's the word go. Go, God says. Go is actually one of the most common commands in all the Bible. When God calls Abram, he says, go to the land I will show you. When God uh, comes to Moses and uh, and calls him uh, to help Israel, he says, go back to Egypt and lead the people out. When God calls Joshua, he says, go and cross the river into the promised land. When Jesus commissions his disciples, the great commission begins with, go and make disciples of all nations. Go, 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 go. Now the reason I emphasize that is because so often in church settings or religious settings, we get stuck on the opposite word. We get stuck on the word stop. I hear this all the time. People tell their story of coming to faith. They say, I met Jesus and then I stopped. And they give me a list of things they've stopped doing or tried to stop doing. I stopped drinking or I stopped swearing or I stopped gossiping. As if the basic moral direction God has for our lives is to stop this, stop that, stop, 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 stop. And maybe that's been your experience in a church setting. Maybe that's part of, you know, just kind of some kind of church baggage that you bring into this place. And now hear me on this. We all have habits that don't honor God's will or God's way of life that need to change and that God wants us to change. It's an essential part of growing in faith to replace those habits with new ones. It's a really good thing to replace alcoholism with sobriety. It's a really good thing to replace impulsive habits of lust with purity. Those are really good things. But hear this, Christian discipleship is not rooted in the word stop. Salvation is not rooted, it's not built around the word stop. And if our whole life is just built on ticking off the things that we've stopped doing, we're gonna miss something major. You see, God didn't come to Abraham and say, stop. He didn't come to David and say, stop. God came and said, go. Go, go, go. Why? Because you see, we are not just saved from something, we are saved for something. You see, Jonah's not just saved from the sea or from the fish, he's saved for something. Nineveh is still in God's mind. There's a purpose, there's a calling in front of him. 
And I wonder in your life where you might feel stuck in this cycle of being saved from this and from this and from this, and no wonder you stop believing. No wonder you get burned out. You're not just saved from something. You are saved for something, which is why the gospel, or Jesus always talks about it's going. Go to that person in need. Go and share your faith. Go and get in recovery. Go and sell all you have. Go, 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 go. And where is Jonah called to go? Nineveh, which as you know is a really bad place to have to go. Nineveh is like Sin City. It's beyond Sin City. It makes the red light district look like Disneyland. It makes UW look like Stanford. Sorry, I just, I couldn't help myself. I just, I just, hey, don't hate, don't hate. I'd say scoreboard, but I'm a a Christian. I shouldn't say that. I just shouldn't do that kind of stuff. Nineveh is too far gone. Nineveh is too messed up. Nineveh is beyond God's reach. Nineveh is not just a place you don't want to go. Nineveh is a place that seems out of God's reach. You see, Jonah, he's not just having a bad attitude about, like, I don't want to be there. I'd be uncomfortable. It's like, God, what's the point? I mean, what's really going to change? Have you looked? Have you seen how bad it is there? I mean, it's as far from God as can be. And guess what? There are people and places in our world and our lives today that are just like this to us. It's that friend or family member that you've prayed for, but they never seem to change. They don't care. It's that peer or colleague who laughs at the way you live or the faith that you have. It's that person you try to show love to, but they respond by just kind of being a jerk. They don't care. It's that situation in your life that never seems to get any better. And you're thinking, there's just no way. There's just no way. And God's saying, that's where we're going. That's to whom we're going. And when you get there, Jonah, when you get to Nineveh, the place where you think there's no way, I have a unique message for you. Listen to what it says. If you remember, this is from the beginning, Jonah 1. God says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now just remember, Nineveh is a really bad place. It was a horrible place. This was the pl- nation that had invaded Israel. They didn't just kill people. They, they murdered innocent women and children. They left bodies lined up along the streets as a show of force and might to the Israelites. If any city deserved a taste of its own medicine, it was Nineveh. But in round two of God's calling, listen to what God says. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Huh. Now why, why? Why does God change the message? Why does God give this new thing? God is telling Jonah, I still want you to go to Nineveh. But when you get there, I want you to stop. I want you to listen to me. Then I want you to say what I tell you to say. Now I don't think this is because God is getting any softer on sin or evil and injustice in our world. Not at all. But sometimes, you see, we don't speak about sin the way that God would speak about sin. Sometimes the message we would give comes from a sinful place in our own heart, not from the place that God would want to get of it. So God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh, and when you get there, pause, listen, and speak the words that I give you. Speak the message I give you. And so Jonah goes. The text says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Hallelujah, right? Finally, he made it. Jonah did it. We should celebrate. There should be an amen. You know, if, if this was, uh, you know, a little more of a charismatic place, we might stand up and scream at this point because God has, Jonah has finally obeyed. Jonah has, fi- after all the ups and downs, Jonah finally does the right thing. And we need to pause and reflect on this because so often, so often in life, we get stuff wrong, we can dwell on that kind of stuff, but when you do the right thing, when we make the right choice, there's moments when you do that, when you're generous, when you don't gossip, when you resist that act of lust or impulsive behavior, when you forgive, when you show love to someone who doesn't deserve it. Sometimes when you do the right thing, when you obey, even if it seems small, you gotta know it pleases God. You need to know it pleases God. Some of you may not know this part of my story. I was single until I was 38 years old. So I spent about 20 20 years of my life in the dating world. 
Now, dating is kind of a funny thing. Dating is one of those strange things that the longer you try it, the worse at it you feel. It's weird that way. I don't know how that works. But to help me with the ups and downs of dating, I had this mentor that I met with, and we'd talk all about it. And usually it was me walking through just mistakes I was making or choices that weren't great or just kind of, you know, it, it just kind of was a messy conversation. And I remember one time when he said, Scotty, tell me about a time in a relationship where you did something right. And so I gave him an example of something that was going on in that part of my life. And he looked me in the eye and said, Scotty, God is so pleased with you when you do that. Question, you think I needed to hear that? Absolutely. Do you think that motivated me to keep living the right way? Absolutely. Did it help me actually get a date? Not a chance. I, I had some real problems, see, but we need to know that our obedience matters because it does. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and it mattered. In fact, the rest of the story hinges on this little act of obedience. Jonah finally goes. The rest of your story might hinge on one small, simple act of obedience. It could hinge on this one small thing and it pleases God. So Jonah obeyed God, went to Nineveh, but just because he obeys doesn't mean life's gonna be easy, right? I mean, we know this, just because you do the right thing doesn't mean your circumstances will always feel easier or better. In fact, listen to what happens to Jonah next as we enter the story. It says, now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. How many days? Three days. Jonah began by going one day's journey. How many days? one day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now this is curious to me. Jonah travels one third of the way into town and he stops, he just stops. Maybe he's frustrated, maybe he's tired, maybe they opened a new Chick-fil-A and he hopped in lines and get free Chick-fil-A for a year, whatever it was, Jonah just stopped. And my guess is, my best guess is, he's probably seen more sin and evil than he can stand. Remember, Jonah is a prophet of God, a man of God, and he's now entering one of the most pagan cities in the world that would have been filled with pagan idols and idolatry and unclean foods and sexual immorality rampant at every street corner. And, you know, he's, he's offended. He's grossed out. He's like, There's, this is, I don't even want to be here. I'm going to be unclean. I'm going to get impure just being in this town. And so he stops. One day in the town, one third of the way in, and he gives what, me, what may be the shortest sh- uh, sermon in human history. It's eight words long. Only six in the original Hebrew. Six word sermon. If only you could be so lucky, right? A six word sermon Jonah gives. And it's incredibly vague. It lacks all the characteristics of Old Testament prophecy we saw a couple of weeks ago. It doesn't, there's no word from the Lord. There's no naming of specific sins. There's no appeal for the victims of injustice. And most importantly, there is no mention of God. No mention of God at all. He just says, you know, whatever happened to God saying, go and proclaim the message I give you. Jonah shows up, gets frustrated, gets annoyed, runs out, of, runs out of energy, and just says, okay, Nineveh, 40 days, and you're toast. That's the message. So what's going on here? Well, again, this is a story filled with surprises, isn't it? Surprise after surprise after surprise. And many scholars believe that even though Jonah has obeyed, it's this kind of dutiful, kind of rote obedience where he's just drawn up the determination to just go and get through it, but he doesn't actually believe that anything's gonna be different. You ever done something in obedience, but you didn't really believe it would matter? Like, I'll I'll give this money, but I mean, it's not gonna make any difference. I'm just doing it because God said. Yes, I'll be kind to this person. I mean, they don't deserve it, but I'll be kind because I go to church and people know that God said. It's this kind of dutiful, rote obedience. Jonah is caught up in what we might call his no-way list. He's got a no-way list, a list of things that there's no way that God's gonna solve through this. And in Nineveh, the no-way list kind of looks like something like this. The messenger's unfit, and the message is too short, and the city's too large, and the culture's too foreign, and people are too wicked. There's just no way God's gonna make a difference in Nineveh. I got a list. I could tell you all about it. And by the way, by the way, by the way, we have these lists, don't we? You and me, I have one. A list of places or people or situations where I would just say, God, there's just no way. Our no way list might look a little bit like this. There's no way God can fix this problem. I mean, it's going on for years. 
There's no way God can heal this pain. It's so deep. It's hurt, hurt me. It's been hurting for me so long. There's no way God can restore this relationship. Do you realize how broken down this is? How long, how long the history has been? There's no way God can reach this person. They hate God. They don't care about God. What's God gonna do, we might say? We all have a no way list. I wonder what's on yours. I have a friend whose father was an alcoholic. He was a highly functioning alcoholic, so he was bright, energetic, and very engaging, which made dealing with the battles at home even more complicated. And my friend prayed for her father for years, not just a few years, but for over 30 years, faithfully praying for her father with no breakthroughs, no conversion moments, no surprise outcomes. And after a while, she told me, I just had it. I've had it with the faith thing. I've had it with the God thing. I've had it with the prayer thing. I've had it with the change thing. There's just no way he's gonna change. And maybe some of you have a situation or person in your life like that. You have a story like that, something that makes you stop expecting, stop hoping, stop believing, stop praying, stop trusting. Well, this is why we're in the book of Jonah. Because the book of Jonah is about what happens when God encounters your no way list. The story of Jonah is about what happens when God wants to do something with, with when you think there's just no way. You wanna see what happens in places like Nineveh? You wanna see what God does next in this story? We're gonna have to, because I'm gonna keep going regardless, either way. So as the story continues, Back to, the, uh, back to the text. Jonah ends this six-word sermon, and this is what happens. It says, the Ninevites believed in God. This is not a typo. This is not a mistake. The Ninevites, the people least likely to believe, the last people on earth who believe, believed in God, and not just some of them, all of them believed. He went one-third of the way through town, and yet the Ninevites, all of them believed. And guess what? God is just getting started. The text continues. It says, they declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Now, sackcloth was this very coarse, abrasive fabric made out of goat hair that a person would put on as a public sign of repentance. It was an act of humility and even humiliation. And it's not just done by the least, it's done by the greatest, the nobles, those with the most pride and social skills, those who would be the least likely to humble themselves in public are putting on sackcloth. But guess what? God is just getting started. Let's keep going in our text. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This brutal dictator gets out of his chair of authority, gets on his knees, covers himself in sackcloth as a public sign of humility and repentance. The people whom the nation of Israel thought would never change, never believe, in fact, they believed he was cursed. Listen to how they wrote about, this is from the prophet Nahum, speaking about the same king, Nahum 3.19 says, nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you will clap their hands at your fall. Oh, he fell indeed to his knees before God. What a surprise. What a surprise. But God was just getting started. God didn't just reach the people. He didn't just reach the nobles. He didn't just reach the king. God transformed the very laws of the land. Look at verse 7. Then the king issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. The king writes a law about the people coming to repent before God. And by the way, have you ever heard of a law that ended with the question? Who knows? I mean, think about it. Have you ever heard of a law that ends? The speed limit is now 70 miles an hour. Who knows? Maybe people will follow it. You know, I don't know. This, that's not how laws are written, especially in that day. A law from a king is like absolute. It's like from a deity. It's like this is the end. There's no other need to discuss. But here, the proclamation ends with an open question as if to say, even the laws of our land are now subject to God's mercy. 
And if you haven't started kind of smiling at all this yet, God didn't just reach all the people and the king and the nobles and the law. God even reached the animals. Look at that verse. Let even the animals be covered with sackcloth. In other words, even the animals repented and were saved. The dogs, the cows, the goats, the cats were beyond mercy because their souls are filled with evil. But all the rest of the animals, they were saved and spared. And by the way, just so you know, God is just getting started. Look at what God does next. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. So now, wait a minute. Jonah is now witnessing. Imagine being Jonah, now witnessing men, women, young, old, rich and poor, from the highest to the lowest, repenting before God, and Jonah's just standing there thinking, no way, no way. And I just imagine God kind of nudging him, saying, oh, Jonah, if you only knew, you see, because here in Nineveh, I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. You see, the book of Jonah is not a great tragedy that ends with no way, no how, not possible. It's a great comedy that ends with joy and laughter and celebration. When God delivered Jonah from the depths of the sea, the joke was on sin and death. When God delivered Nineveh from their sin, the joke is now on Jonah. The joke's on the prophet. The joke is on the man of God. The joke is on the religious leader. The joke is on the church. The joke is on all of us who say we believe, but inside are thinking, I don't believe God can really do that. I don't believe God can really change that. You see, the book of Jonah, the joke is really on those of us who have settled for a God of measurable, expected, sensible outcomes. When the God of the Bible, the God of Jonah, is a God of immeasurable grace and unexpected mercy and impossible outcomes. Do you see it? Do you see it? I told you about my friend who'd been praying for a father for over 30 years, 30 years of no breakthroughs, no changes, no surprise outcomes, to the point where she was thinking, I've had it with this faith thing, I've had it with this God thing, I've had it with this prayer thing. But then several months before her father ended up passing away, she was sitting with him and just out of nowhere, he just prodded her and said, I just, I'd like to talk to you about that God thing. And she said, okay, and they had this conversation. And then to her great surprise, her father prayed and surrendered his life to God. You see, just when she thought things were finished, God was just getting started. I have an old friend of mine from the Bay Area who was a brilliant business leader, an amazing guy, but you know, he had a great life, made a lot of money, had the house and the car and the social life and all that, but got involved in some practices that weren't ethical and ended up getting caught and going to prison in San Quentin and losing everything. And he said he would literally lie curled up in a fetal position in, cell, in his cell and pray that God would d- take his life, pray for his own death. But then there were some other inmates in that prison that began to share with him the story about this God of the, a God who could do anything, a God who could always make a way. And he started to get up every morning and pray to this God and he discovered a kind of significance and purpose that he never knew on the outside world. And eventually, when he was finally released, he spent his life pouring into other people. We served together in Young Life for years. And he told me that it wasn't until he thought his life was finished that he discovered that God was just getting started. I met a man here at church just a couple of weeks ago who had been an atheist for years. He didn't believe in God, didn't even want to do 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 with God. Then almost out of nowhere, he felt like God was calling him just to go back to church. So he showed up at church and he told me, you know about this God thing? And then he literally started to break down in tears and said, I just thought I was done with that. I just wanted to tell him in that moment, oh, if only you knew, God is just getting started. He's just getting started. So what about you? Maybe there's a situation or something going on in your life or your family that seems beyond repair. Maybe there's a prayer that you've stopped praying because God just seems silent. Maybe there's a person in your life that feels so out of reach, God's just a joke to them. Maybe you have a Nineveh in your life and all you can think is, no way, no way, no way. So what if, what if God doesn't see that situation as an impasse? What if he sees it as a situation that can show you that with God, anything's possible. What if just when you think God is finished, God is just getting started? How would it change your life? 
How would it change how you live? How would it change what kind of person you want to be? In your marriage, or in that relationship, or in that search for one, or at work, or in your health? The answer may not be what you expect or when you expect it, but God isn't done with you. God isn't done with you. God isn't done with that person or that situation or that problem. What if God is just getting started? How do I know? Because when Jonah went to Nineveh and he thought those people were finished, God was just getting started. And when Daniel was thrown into a lion's den and people thought his life was finished, God was just getting started. And the Israelites reached the Red Sea with the armies of Pharaoh bearing down on them and everyone thought they were finished. God was just getting started. And when Jesus went to Jerusalem and was executed on a cross and buried in his tomb and the disciples scattered in fear thinking their Savior's life is finished, but then on that third day, Jesus rose as if to say, by the way, by the way, I'm just getting started. So, maybe God isn't finished with your no way list. Maybe God isn't quite done in your life. Maybe he's just getting started. Before we close in a time of prayer, you know, when I think back to this moment in Jonah's life, I love to imagine, as I've showed you, what Jonah might be thinking. I wonder what Jonah was thinking in this moment. I imagine it was something like this. Amazing, unbelievable. Yay, God, praise God. God's grace has truly now won the day. God, I get it, I see it, I understand. God, we should do something about this. We should start by writing it down. We'll call it the book of Jonah. It will have three chapters to tell about the three great things you've done in this great story. We'll, we'll, we'll just celebrate you with that. But heck, why should we stop with the story? We'll build a church right here in Nineveh. We'll call it the first church of Nineveh because it's the first church of Nineveh. That's perfect. And we'll together, we'll bring people together and we'll celebrate how the lost get found and the prodigals come home and how Nineveh got saved. But you see, that's not how the book of Jonah ends. There is one more chapter in this great story, one more surprising and tragic surprise to come about how this little story ends. And if you want to hear about that, you're going to have to come back next week. But if you would, if you pray with me. Jesus, I just want to start by confessing in my own life, um, I live with this very long and specific no way list. All the places where I feel like you can't, or you won't, or you didn't, and therefore you, there's no way. And we as a church, we need to confess how we live so often tied to that kind of posture of saying we believe in you with our words but in our heart going, I just don't think so. And so God, may the joke be on us this morning. (laughs) May the laugh wake us up this morning. The surprise of this story, this amazing little story where in the midst of Jonah's doubt, And after that tiny little sermon, you changed a city, you changed lives, you changed the world. God, remind us this morning how you are able, how you can, how you can make a way when we think there is no way. And God, we, I pray that prayer over each situation, each circumstance where we would use that word impossible or no way or I don't think so. God, help us be faithful as we wait, knowing that the answer you bring may not be what we expect or when we expect it. Help us hang in there and hold to you, knowing, knowing, knowing that there is a surprise to come, knowing that your work is not finished, knowing that you're just getting started, knowing that eternity awaits. God, help us remember that you are the God with whom anything's possible. And we saw that on the cross. We saw that three days later with the empty tomb. And may that be true in our lives and in our church and for our world this week. May we be the church of what's possible. We pray that in your name. Amen.